Well, hello everybody joining us from uh, all over the world. Uh, we've got people, uh, we had a session this morning and, uh, and this one this afternoon. We've had over 100 people registered across the two sessions. Uh, delighted uh, that uh, so many people have joined us for You Are Not Alone from Isolation into Opportunity in Times of Crisis. Uh, I'm Chris Robb. Um, I've met many of you. Nice to see so many familiar faces on the feed. Uh, and delighted to be joined by a wonderful panel uh, this afternoon from uh, a, a range of different places going uh, all the way from Australia, starting with uh, Shelley Wild uh, up in Cairns. Shelley is the general manager. Uh, sorry, she is the uh, managing director of People HQ and the founder of the Human Learning Collective, and she's joining us from Cairns. Hello, Shelley. Uh, we've got Craig Johns, who is uh, the CEO and founder of NRG to Perform in Canberra, uh, and they're doubling up. They were, we had a great session this morning with Gaylene Clues, um, who, who was unable to join us this afternoon, but very adequately replaced by Azran Osman Rani, who's joining us from Kuala Lumpur. Hi, Azran, great to see you two, two days in a row. It was, uh, we, we had a chat yesterday as well. Uh, yep. and, and an old friend uh, joining all the way from Varese in Italy, the epicenter of, of, of part of COVID-19. Thanks for making the time. Shane Bannon, the general manager of Green Edge Cycling. Great to see you again, Shane. Thank, thanks for all of you for joining us. And Shane, uh, as you're probably aware, you're the the inspiration and motivation for, for, for today. I was talking to Craig last week, just uh, we just had a social chat on, on WhatsApp and, and during the course of that, Shane shared with me that uh, as he was sharing with the panelists before we came on, on air that uh, he's been um, for, for nearly nine weeks now in, in isolation, if I've got the timing right, and the only human interaction that he's had in that period of time has been going down to the local supermarket. And it made me realize that Some of us are lucky to be with family and, 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 and other environments, but there's many people all over the world that are, that are completely on their own. And, and you know, people, whether they're, they're on their own physically, but a lot of people feeling on their own mentally at the moment with the challenges that we're going through. So I felt it would be a great opportunity to pull this together uh, and really excited to, to have the opportunity. I just wanted to quickly touch on a couple of other initiatives that, that I have running um, every Monday, Uh, at, at uh, 8.30 in the morning, Singapore time, 4.30 in the afternoon. I run a session called Strength in Numbers, which is literally a, an open Zoom chat room uh, opportunity for people from the industry all over the world just to come and share their observations, their challenges, what's been happening. And we've had some great insights over the weeks on that. Um, it is just a register once so that you get the link. Um, I, I post a lot of the details with all of this on, on my LinkedIn and Facebook and the Mass Participation World Facebook page. But if you can't find it, please email me, chris at chrisrob.asia, and I'd be very happy to share those details with you. Um, I then started uh, three weeks ago an initiative called The Aid Station, where I'm interviewing different people in the industry, and that was why Azran and myself were chatting yesterday. That went live today, so there are about 15-minute interviews with people from across the industry, from high-profile people to, uh, to other people doing different ordinary roles, and no one's ordinary in our industry. Tonight, later on, I'm interviewing Joe DeSena, the founder of, uh, of Spartan, so really excited about that. Uh, and those go, go live, they're pre-recorded, but they go live um, most day, well, every day of the week, pretty much every morning. Um, and then these, uh, these weekly masterclasses every Thursday, typically in two time slots. And next week, we're going to be doing one with um, a couple of experts in social distance, distancing. So Paul Foster, who's the founder of One Plan out of London, and Marcel Altenberg, who's a senior crowd science lecturer out of Manchester Metropolitan University. And we're going to be talking about, um, you know, applying social distancing when we come forward. We've got obviously more, more questions than answers at the moment in terms of when we resume and, and, and uh, what, what uh, restrictions we may be under. Uh, but uh, that might be an interesting one. In terms of this afternoon, we've allocated an hour. So we've got about, uh, you know, 50 odd minutes left now. And we're going to focus on seven key areas of discussion. And I think against the background, there's no attempt whatsoever to, to I guess, trivialize or overlook the fact that there's, there's many people that are struggling at the moment. There's people that are losing businesses. There's people that are cutting back employees. There's people that have lost loved ones as a result of it. And we don't want to overlook that fact, but we want to try and take a positive slant to it today to give some some specific tools and techniques that people can take away with them to be able to apply when you go back to your teams, when you, when you might be in isolation yourself. So, you know, really want to stress there's no, 
you know, there's no attempt to brush over that there's not lots of people struggling. And in fact, that's the, that's the real reason why I put this together to recognize that there are some people that might need some, some, uh, some strategies and techniques to help them manage in this particular situation. So uh, in, in terms of seven key areas, we're gonna talk a, talk a little bit about the opportunity that this presents for introspection, the opportunity for us to revisit valuables and values and principles that guide us through these times. Uh, we're gonna be talking a little bit about the fact that as endurance athletes, whether you are an endurance athlete like Azran or, 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 or Craig, uh, you're in an industry that does a lot of work around endurance athletes. And, and in, in many ways, we probably have a little bit of an advantage in terms of the exposure that we've had that might give us some, some skills to be able to work through here. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the fact that um, we have this constantly shifting finish line. And, and I was talking, I interviewed Andrew Messick for the aid station, the global CEO of Ironman um, a couple of weeks ago. And you know, he was saying, I, I tell my staff that Imagine that you're running the marathon. It's, it's the end of Ironman and just put one foot in front of the other. And, you know, that is in one way the reality of it, except, you know, it's like running the marathon and starting off thinking you're running 42 kilometers and then it becomes 50 kilometers and then it becomes 100 kilometers. It's kind of a never-ending finish line. And obviously that has a significant impact on us emotionally, psychologically, and we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the decision-making process on a day-to-day -day and week-to-week -week basis. We'll talk about the importance of planning in recovery time. Uh, we'll talk about, there's a lot of people that are getting really excited that this is an opportunity to create new habits, to learn new skills, but the importance of making sure we don't throw everything out and try and inflict a, a complete new routine and new learning on us. And it's a matter of retaining a little bit of balance of not, not all out with the old, maintaining some of the old and bringing in some of the new. And then we'll talk about the, the real importance of daily connection time, the, the, the scientific proof of, you know, and, and, and Shane, Shane's, Shane's already spoken about that, you know, that actual human to human that some of us can't, but the, the, the importance of connecting on a daily basis, whether it be on Zoom, whether it be on the phone, because that actually has chemical reactions in our body, like, uh, like releasing oxytocin that helps us to deal with some of these challenges. And then, at the end of it, once we wrap up, I'm going to come back to each of the panelists and, and we're going to get seven tips plus a bonus tip um, of, of particular strategies that you might be able to go away and, and implement in your daily life as you go forward. So hopefully that sounds good for everyone. Hopefully that, that resonates with everyone and we're up for that and, and being a part of it. And I'll, I think I'll start by, if I can, Shelley, like I did this morning, uh, come to you at the start and when we were doing our planning call, you, you spoke about you know, one of your favorite quotes, which is a Winston Churchill quote, which uh, he says, never let a good crisis go to waste. And, and part of your interpretation of that is the opportunity of introspection to revisit value, values and principles to have that kind of guiding light. So why don't we start with that, if I may? Oh, it, yes, it's a quote that's been resonating with me for a couple of weeks now. And it took me, at first I didn't quite... I knew it, but I thought, what does this all mean for me? And um, and what's um, been beautiful about me exploring that quote is, you know, well, what is a crisis? Well, a crisis is many things for many people, and there's different crises, and we're all sort of but in this crisis together, which is kind of cool in a way. Um, but I think a crisis gives us this beautiful alchemy, and we say that uh, a lot of us talk about transformation. A lot of us talk about getting better and being better and, and improving ourselves. Well, I think sometimes that happens because we've got heat and the heat is what causes this beautiful um, transformation to happen. You know, steel can't be something beautiful without heat, you know. So I think the crisis gives us this heat. And for me, uh, what's happened is the crisis, I've gone internal where I've done a lot of self-reflecting about what does this all mean for me and what can I do to actually think about how I can change as a result of what's happening. And also there's all of the craziness out there, but also how am I going to adapt to that craziness? So for me, I've seen the crisis as definitely an opportunity. Um, there's been bad days, don't get me wrong. I've had my bad days. <laughs> but um, I think it's been, you know, wow. I, this, I can't do anything about this, but I can control what I can do about me and I can control where I want to go with this. So that's, that's why that quote was really important to me. Yes. And thanks for that, Charlie. And you talk, a, sorry, Craig, you carry on there. 
Yeah, I think when you go on the introspection, I think it's really important to understand your habits and routines that you currently have or, or, mm-hmm. or the values you're facing as you go into the introspection and think about what is important that you want to hold in the future and what are things do you want to change? And so it can be quite easy right now to make that shift in what's important to us just for the situation. But however, because we're going to be in it for quite a, quite a period of time, that will form as a long-term habit if you allow it to be. And so think about, will that actually support me and serve me in the future? So I think you've got to be a little bit careful around that is to make sure those changes and shifts you make have a long-term approach, but also serve you right now. It's a great point. And this morning we spoke a little bit about, about relevance. You know, how, how is the, our relevance in our particular roles, our businesses, how is that going to evolve post-COVID as, as well as, you know, right now, this is where we are. Those, those principles and values going forward as to how they overlay to your relevance moving forward. Yeah, I think uh, one of the things I can pick up on there before we throw to someone else is um, the brain needs a degree of certainty, but it also needs what we call a sense of belonging or relatedness to self. And so one way we can do that to give ourselves certainty is to anchor ourselves back to our values, as um, Craig is saying, and to be able to uh, build on the role that we want to play now, currently, and into the future. And uh, because I think when we explore our values, uh, what it does is it settles us down because we can tap into our historical values, which have been very important to us, but also we can start to look at the values that we might need going forward. And I have this little thing that helps me out. My values and anchor me but my principles define me and because with the principle you've got to have trade-offs right and I think at the moment I'm getting to redesign my principles you know like um, we're doing a lot of work at the moment for free and it feels so good so we're taking joyful generous work over some stuff that we used to do that I don't really like anymore (laughs) so it's been this really nice thinking about yeah one of my values is generosity and then, of course, one of my principles now is going to take joyful, you know, work over just making money. Does that? So that's just what's been helping me start to think about how I can shift myself and then come out of this um, transformed in some way and then transform my business as a result. So I hope that helps. It's great. And, and Azran, you, you gave a great example of that in our interview yesterday on the aid station of, of, of the, the hotel manager who literally has zero revenue. Maybe you'd like to share a little bit about that story. Sure, you know, for me, it illustrates how different people respond to crisis situation. You know, here is an entrepreneur who's completely devastated, right? She owns a hotel and a restaurant and all zero bookings. And instead what she does is she focuses her time and energy to raise money for the underprivileged in Langkawi Island where we have our annual Ironman tournament. Because when she has an outlet and she feels that sense of purpose coming, right? It, it allows it to move away from just this feeling of, you know, being sorry for yourself and being frustrated with your situation. And it, it you know, it, it creates a lot of energy for her. So, you know, that's why I find that, you know, it's incredibly inspiring for, for people to look for these new opportunities. But I think, you know, just, just to add on, right? One, yes, it's about kind of, you know, being anchored on values, but the hard part oftentimes is we're terrible at trying to just process and understand our own values by ourselves, right? And the mere act of reaching out and having a conversation with someone and and that conversation allows us to clarify our thoughts, right? And so if we pick the right people who can be powerful mirrors, not to judge us and, and tell us what to do, right? But just to help balance up what we're feeling, those values become a lot clearer when you have to go through the process of, you know, explaining it to someone or explaining your situation, right? And it's understanding what your trade-offs are. So I think that's why that human connection becomes important because on our own, just naturally, it's very hard for us to kind of figure this out by ourselves. Yeah, great point. And, and Shane, I'm, I'm guessing you, you must be being a mirror for a lot of people. I mean, you've got a professional cycling team that's obviously hungry to race. We were talking before, some of them in Australia, others in Spain. And I'm sure that, you know, you must be acting as a mirror for a lot of those people right now. Sure, Chris. Let me clarify one point. It's, um, it's not that I haven't got any friends. That's why I haven't spoken to anybody <laughs> face to face for nine weeks. 
Uh, it's just that they're, they're not here. Um, look, one, one thing I, I learned very, very early in, in the situation was, um, you know, we're, we're a professional cycling team at the moment. There's, there's no competition, which means, and, and our sponsors are, are struggling. So straight away, we have to make, make some decisions that was going to allow us, one, to retain retain uh, all of our staff and athletes and hopefully navigate our way through to get to the end of the year where, when there may or may not be competitions. So very, uh, I've, I've got 100 people in the organisation of, um, of athletes and, and staff. So I found it was very important uh, when, when we made these decisions to, to contact each person individually and do that via using the, the video on, on WhatsApp in this particular case. So that really, and uh, and basically to tell them that the future was uncertain in terms of will we compete, won't we compete, uh, but also to let them know that there'll be a pretty large reduction, salary reduction. I didn't know how long it was going to last. Uh, so, so to try and work through that strategy over that two days prior to to calling uh, each individual, which took me three days, was a was a couple of pretty sleepless nights. Now to get through that, and we we spoken about principles, and what what helped me was to go back to the basic principles of, of what got us to this point of being a being a high performance team, and it it's, it really um, helped me certainly get through it, and and. Talking to each individual was, I found really, personally, I found really good therapy, if I've got to be honest, because each individual have, have their own particular way with, with dealing with the, the situation. Some of the conversations were pretty tough uh, because of the ec economical uh, situation. Some, some people in, in our, in our organisation, uh, uh, like mechanics and masseurs, are getting as much as some of our high price high-profile staff and riders are. So it was, a, it was a, certainly a, diff, a different discussion. But d during the d discussion, there was certainly a lot of uh, what, what these people want in these times of uncertainty are facts. They, they, don't, want, um, they, they don't want the situation skirted around. So they don't want a me to create false hope so they, they want factual information. So it was really getting back to the basic principles one, which allowed me to give that factual information, which made the these hard conversations um, really good conversations. So that, that's what I, I found uh, to, to certainly get through that period. And that set up uh, the situation that we're, we're still working through. So that, that factual, honest assessment one to one from the start uh, gave gave us the platform to to work through the the challenges that are thrown up with us uh, daily and, and that we're currently working through. But I I just um, uh, felt that 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 approach uh, really really put us in good stead for bouncing ideas and, and getting through this this current situation. One of the things I talk about is intimacy and isolation so a question for you shane is you know when you're in that situation you've got to call your 100 staff you're talking to one each individually are you learning a lot more about those people than what you knew before like with are there are there real true character traits coming out absolutely um craig probably not so much in in the athletes or maybe one or two of them because i mean they're they're, they're under a lot of pressure during the competition so you learn a quite, quite a bit about the individual under the stress of the competition uh, as well as the, the staff but certainly a good point is under extreme circumstances you certainly learn more about the way people react and you know we we call this a pretty extreme circumstance and, you know that when you when you're dealing when you're dealing with high level high level athletes and there was there were uh, some of the com conversations, Craig, was uh, I would only get halfway through what the deduction would be and some of the guys and, and girls would, hey, Shane, do what you have to do because we all want to get through this 
as a as a team. So they were they were the easy, easy conversations. The other conversations were, well, how, how am I going to pay for the rent? How am I going to put food on the table? They were more diff, they were obviously more of a difficult conversation. But I would say 98 percent of the conversations were relatively easy. There were two percent that you would probably see a little bit a, a, a bit 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 hard to say it was selfishness. Uh, but, but certainly uh, uh, a lot more stress involved. Shane, just to, just to pick up with that on, on the difficult conversations, there's probably some people sitting on the call who are, who are going to have some of those difficult conversations where, you know, they're not going to necessarily have the staff member who says, that's great or we want to be part of this. Any particular tips or anything that you, you could give for them in, in, in terms of, you know, how, how, you, how you manage that situation? The, the difficult yeah, aspects. absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, Chris. Uh, absolutely, and the, and the way you, the way I managed it uh, was just to be totally honest, um, uh, you know. And, and uh, you know, some of the, the typical questions were, "When are things going to get back to normal?" Uh, sorry, yeah. there is going to be a new normal. You know, we we can't expect the same situation that we currently had or previously had. There will be a new normal in the future. So the you know the approach of, of um, obviously giving hope, but factual hope. So being a very very honest uh, uh, honest conversation, because then if things do get hopefully a bit easier in the future, then that's a bonus. Uh, but what you lay out now when you have these initial conversations have to be factual and they have to be honest with, without creating a false. Um, impression or giving fake news. Thanks. thanks I can pick up on that, Chris, if you like. Yeah, great, Shelley. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, there's a, there's um, because <clears throat> I, I'm into social cognitive needs or social cognitive neuroscience, which is the neuroscience that's required to meet our needs when we're in a social situation or in groups. And so, what I love about what Shane's saying is, um, two of the needs that the brain is desperate for is to see progress. 50% of our brain is dedicated to information through the eyes. So we want to see facts and, 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 and make progress, which is why, you know, setting goals and mapping your progress and to see how you're moving forward is important. But that same need is met through facts, you know, like just pure objective data. We may not like the data, you know, we may not necessarily... Um, agree with the data, but at least it's the data that we can then be quite objective about. And one of the other social cognitive needs that we're desperate for as humans is to actually have a sense of tomorrow. We actually need hope, you know, to know that tomorrow is going to be a better day. And if we can't, if we, if we know the external world is messy, we can give hope through some certainty, you know, not false hope, absolutely not false hope, because we're bigger than that as human beings, we smile out a mile away. <laughs> And it's that honesty and then that providing, you know, that next step with, it, with sincerity, hope and creating some optimism, you know. I think I've seen, you know, based off that, I've seen with the CEOs or the businesses that have been able to um, change their, their or pivot fast and been able to really, I suppose, thrive in this situation. And there's, there's, there's probably not that many that are, but those that are have given real clear direction, they have which gives a calming aspect and then provides that hope. And the other ones that I've seen who have um, made the best progress during this time, rather than those that have kind of been hesitant to, to you know, they're, not, they're unsure about what they're doing. So it's just that ability to think quick, here's a direction, whether it's the right direction or not, they're just giving direction, which is, makes a big difference to calm the other staff down or people around them. Liken that to being like on a ship. You imagine you're being a captain of a ship and you're in a bit of a storm, but you actually can't give direction. So the whole ship just feels out of control, right? And all the people on it are like, but it's, a good captain says, I'm going to steady this ship. <laughs> we're going to tack this way and it's going to be for this long until I work out the next step. But you've got that great steadfastness that arrives in leadership, which is amazing. That's great, Craig. I loved, I loved hearing that. Thank you. Ezra, yeah. you're, you're nodding there. I'd love to bring you into that. Well, you know, besides uh, the, the certainty from future, the other thing that we humans, you know, care a lot about is our relative position. 
right? And so no matter how good or bad, actually we judge it not so much in its absolute sense, but in its relative sense. So that was why, for example, when, you know, we had to go through, we had to figure out how can we take at least 30 to 40% of our payroll out, right? But instead of doing across the board cuts, right? My co-founder and I said, we have to lead from the front. We take the full breath, right? So we go 100% without salary and we ask our leaders to take bigger cuts to protect the, um, the salaries of the junior people, right? And so it becomes a lot more palatable when you ask certain people, look, you know, can you take this, but, you know, just to, you know, to, so that other people don't have to take as much, we'll take the bigger brunt of it. And, and it, it, that was something that I felt worked better, right? Because people so, sort of understand it more from a relative basis. That's, uh, that's really interesting. Yeah, it makes, makes perfect sense. Makes per perfect sense. L love to maybe switch a little bit tack now in terms of, uh, you know, change, changing routines. Um, we, we spoke about the, the learning new things, what you re retain before you let go. Maybe, um, you know, Azran, given that you're on, on, on screen there, you're, you're, you, you do so much work in executive coaching and running businesses and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, some, some, some of the stuff that you're, you're talking about and with your team as well about as they upskill themselves, this opportunity that this time uh, gives some sort of guidelines and tips in terms of not throwing out everything and, and, and relearning everything new? Yeah, I think first, just, just to set a bit of context, because when we help organizations provide support for, um, for employees, right, we recognize that there are three different stages. So there are a first set of people who need to reach out because frankly, they just need an outlet to vent, right? There's a lot of anger, which is just an initial reaction. If you give them the space and you validate their feelings, actually they kind of self-regulate and they get better uh, in the next half hour, right? So sometimes it's just a matter of giving people space to vent in a safe manner. Now on the other extreme are people who genuinely have, you know, clin a clinical situation, a health situation where the level of depression and anxiety is very serious because you can see this because sleep's been completely disrupted. They're simply unable to function. Right? And there we have to go kind of deeper on a one-on-one -on -one basis. These are things you can't fix with one conversation. Right? There's, there's a whole structured process to that. But there's a middle group who kind of struggle because they recognize they need to make certain behavioral changes. Oftentimes it's issues like sleep. Right? Or how can I get exercise when I'm locked down in my home right, right? when normally I need to go out there on my bike or on the run and, and all the pools are closed. Right? And, and they get frustrated because they're taken out of their element and routine. And it's for this group where, you know, a lot of times it's not about giving a full solution, but figuring out a starting point. What's the smallest change you can make, right? And, and make it a daily routine and habit, but more importantly, creating accountability, right? So because we can be there with them online and say, okay, in the next two to three days, how did that go? Uh, did you get stuck? If you got stuck, what was the reason? Let's problem solve and figure something out, right? And so when you do that in a guided manner and you focus on sort of one small change at a time, we can start to address uh, these things. And, and normally this is why people on their own, when they know there are tons of blog articles about how do you sleep better? How do you run remote teams better? The knowledge is there, but they don't implement, right? Because there's no impetus to actually start with the first step and someone holding you accountable to make sure that you're there every two to three days to check in that you're actually following through on what you say you're going to do. I think on that, you know, it's interesting, you know, I see the question in the chat there. So thanks Manfred for asking a great question there. So I think what's important during this time is people know they need to make some change. You know, it's uncertain times. People are having to upskill, upgrade, but what's really important is the certainty aspects. We need a bit of both at the moment. And so for me, what I found really effective and I use with a number of people as well is that 80% of what you do is based on what you've currently been doing, what you know, what is routine, what you're used to, and what you had already planned for the future. Because at some stage, we will come back to a position where what you've done in the past will be still relevant in the future. And then giving them the opportunity for 20% is room to play. So when we're talking about giving clear direction and, and you're talking, you're asking there around 
well, it could there be backlash if we give too much hope and we go down the wrong path. If you keep 80% of what you do as kind of a normal aspect and a routine and just and be very open at the beginning, we are going to choose this path and we're going to give ourselves some room to make some mistakes, to be vulnerable, have a bit of courage here because no one in the world is certain about what's going to happen. So we need to take that leap of faith and have a go, but let's lower the risk a little bit and we'll use 20% of our time to focus on how we can upskill, upgrade and be better in the future or cope more effectively with what's happening at the moment. And that might be a little bit difficult for those running events at the moment on this call because you're sitting there going, I don't know when I can run an event. Is it going to be two months time? Is it going to be this year? Is it going to be next year? And, and so there's some difficult things to have in your head, but you still need to put things in place to be able to deliver events in the future. Now that 20% could be, could be really effective and innovative ways that you can look at new revenue streams for your business. Um, I've seen, I work with someone at the moment who works with cafes and in the hospitality industry. And what's been amazing is at the beginning, they lost 80% of their revenue in the first couple of weeks, 80% gone because they couldn't open their cafes, but they still had a wholesale business within two more weeks after that, they were back to 50% of what their revenue was. And now they're back to 30%. They still have not opened the cafes to people to walk in yet, but they're only 30% away from their revenue. So they've been very clever about how do they utilize their skill sets to go, okay, how can we actually generate revenue and how can we reduce our expenses so that we have a more efficient and more effective company in the future? Uh, it's been amazing to watch them in that space where most people are really struggling. And I think you can do this in the event space as well. If you think outside the square a little bit and you know, we're seeing a lot of people with their virtual events and how you can utilize that as a potential income stream. We're watching a lot of people right now who think they need to give away everything for free. It's not correct. People will see value. We're going to see a shift in mindset shortly where people have had enough of all the free stuff and they're going to want to start paying for things because they'll see more value in it. So don't be afraid of charging for the skill sets you have. And you've got some incredible skill sets as event managers to maybe diversify a little bit and use those skills in another space right now. You know, one good example was a company and I forget their name. They were doing museum tours across, you know, New York, Chicago and all that. And of course, their entire revenue just completely uh, evaporated. They pivoted to now doing remote team building activities online and it's growing, right? So basically they, they took kind of the, all the colorful characters of the, um, uh, the tour guides and turned them into online team builders, which by the way, if you think about it, is something that companies need, right? Because you got to figure it out now new ways to build team cohesion online. So I thought that was a pretty neat example of a complete pivot. Yeah, really interesting. Thank you. A couple of questions in, 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 the, in the comments here. So we've got Onslo saying, um, Azran, wondering if the health application you are working on addresses or connects with people regarding anxiety, stress, lack of control, or any of the other issues that pop up during these times of isolation. And do you see ways in the future to assist with preemptive solutions? Do you want to talk, talk to that yeah. one? Azran? So the short answer is that's the core of what we do. Uh, we provide digital psychological services but we try to challenge the, the way it's traditionally done, which is either face-to-face -face or even a, a, a live video session like this. Because the problem with a live session is if I'm talking to you, I can't talk to anyone else. And the problem in emerging markets is we have a massive scarcity of professional qualified psychologists and counselors. So we need to figure out a completely different model. And so what we said was let's reinvent it from one-on-one -on -one, sort of one hour a week type model to an instant messaging type model where it's sort of five, 10 minutes of chat, but almost every single day. So you actually now have con continuity and then we add a lot of digital tools to kind of provide more self-help work, right? Whether it's assessment type tools to quantify levels of depression, anxiety, and stress to, um, you know, things like um, thought journaling, right? As a way for people to start to recognize their emotions by first expressing it online. And then you start to see patterns around that. And, and then uh, 
kind of teaching different things that you can do um, online. So that allows us to basically take one qualified psychologist <laughs> We would serve 50 clients a month in a synchronous manner to now we're at 440 to one, yeah. right? So, so mm. to make it more accessible and therefore be able to drive down the cost of these services to, you know, just, um, you know, a few dollars a month, for example. Fantastic. Hey, let's, let's swing back to, to Shane there. We were talking a little bit uh, when Craig was talking about, you know, the shifting goalposts and, and, and clearly that's been a, been a, a, a real thing for you in terms of, you know, there's just an, another calendar being released by the UCI and, uh, you, you know, that, that gives you something to focus on. But, you know, some, some techniques of, you know, I'm sure most, most of us on this call are saying, you know, where, 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 where is the finish line? And, and that finish line is multifaceted. You know, Azran was telling me he went for his first run outside for, I, I think you said, uh, you know, five, five or six weeks yes, uh, yesterday morning because literally lockdown in, in Kuala Lumpur was military and police in the streets and people being arrested for running in the grounds of their condos. M much more onerous than, than, than some other parts of the world. And, but, you know, you've got that. So when are we going to be freed? You've got athletes wanting to race. You've got organizers wanting to put events on. How have you been managing those shifting goalposts, please, Shane? Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I mean, the high performance has no finish line. So <laughs> yeah. how have we how have we been managing it? Um, I, I think it gets back to the initial Winston Churchill statement from, from Shelley in, in looking for opportunities. So our, our opportunities sort of came in the virtual world. Um, it, there's a, a platform called Swift, um, and we started we, we started doing social rides on there, team rides, and, and that was that that's been great. Um, just hooking up on a on a team ride with our riders and staff, and uh, with um, Zoom as well, so we can see each other riding. Um, so so that that's been a really good a really good initiative, as well as we we're, we're starting to compete in the virtual world also. Uh, so, you know, the athletes are finding that quite stimulating. I mean, it's all inside and it, and it is a different physiology, but it's um, at the moment there is a, a competition on Eurosport Live called Tour for All, uh, which in, is involving, I, I think, seven World Tour teams and, and some other teams. So we've been doing course re recon, getting the sport director and the coaches to having, having a look at the the courses in the virtual world. Uh, so they've been, they've really been um, uh, doing the same type of preparation in terms of logistics and make up logistics just to keep people stimulated, you know, and the, and the, the, the staff, the only, I mean, obviously they, they can't get massaged and the mechanics don't have that much value in the, in the virtual world. It's, it's more, we need more electronic technicians and the mechanics. But it's certainly something, Chris, that's helped us help the uh, the riders be stimulated during this period, and and uh, a large number of the staff because they have team meetings prior to the event. They have team meetings afterwards. Yeah, sure, it's different in the virtual world, uh, but we've tried to make it a little bit of fun, a little bit of um, reality, and and we're getting some really good visual impact from it. So. You know, through crisis comes opportunity, and that's the opportunity that we've found. Yes, and I think that comes, thank you, Shane, it comes a little bit back to what you were talking about earlier, uh, Shelley, of, you know, some degree of certainty, something to put a, put a focus on. Yes, absolutely. And you know, it's funny, as I'm listening to you all, and um, you're in this amazing industry, and I go in and out of lots of different industries as um, kind of a human performance person. Um, so, for example, at the moment, I work with a lot of nurses. And so you can imagine what they're going through. But they have no dialogue around endurance. They don't know how to be fit for their roles. And they're having to make really complex, quick decisions under pressure. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, your entire industry, we just need to get all the things you know and shuffle it off to a whole heap of nurses around the world right now and suddenly you've kind of reframed yourselves. Um, so that, that I was just sitting here thinking, oh my gosh, you guys are sitting on so much amazing information and capability and tips that they are just so, they would love at the moment. 
So that was just me. I'm just having a moment, Chris, as I thought of that. <laughs> I, think that's, I think that's really a good point because quite often we sit in our own little bubbles, our own little worlds, and we think what we do is normal every day. And to it, us, it is. It's very normal. Yeah. But to everyone else in the world, it's amazing content. Yeah. So use that opportunity, which whichever part of the event industry or sport industry you're in or um, or as a sponsor or supporter, whatever it may be, and think about the skills that you have and how can you keep that simple and help someone else. Mm. And the key thing yeah. here is simple. So I like the term simplification is sophistication. <laughs> to take what's normal to you, keep it really simple, and it will be sophisticated and absolutely amazing for someone else. And as you were saying there, Shelley, what the skill sets we have in the event and sports space through resilience and coping and mm. being able to make decisions at speed and under high pressure, people are going through that for the first time right now and you're used to doing it all the time. It is your normal work. So yeah. if you're looking for an opportunity, there's one for you right there. Mm. It's, a, it's, a, it's a really great point. And I you know, tied in earlier on, we spoke about you know, endurance athletes being, being so well qualified. I'd like to stay with you, Craig, and talk about, and we touched on this again this morning, the importance of, again, the analogy of the athlete, but so important in these times, recovery time. So you know, you're, 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 as an athlete, when you're training, you have this kind of periodization, you have some rest time. There's a lot of people at the moment that are, no differentiation, distinction between home and work, get up in the jammies and the t-shirt and the, and, and the tracky dacks and sit there all day long and work until nine, 10 o'clock at night, no, no structure, but also no recovery of it's, it's okay, I'm on a roll. Uh, you had some great insights around that this morning and, and I'd lo love to hear some of those, please. Yeah, so I think I'll start with the marathon aspect here. We, we're in for a marathon. And a marathon, if you hold the right pace, you can sustain for a long time. However, during this time, you're requiring quite a few sprints. Now, when you sprint, you require a higher quality of recovery than what you do when you're going easy. So the faster you go and the harder you push right now, the more recovery time you're gonna need if you want high productivity and high performance in the work that you're doing. So that's one aspect to look at. When we, if, if you've been an athlete, and I imagine many of you have been, you normally look at your recovery and that's where the performance gains occur. So you need to, when you look at your work and when you're in your home environment, you can only be really productive and hold a, sustain a high level of performance for up to about 50 to 60 minutes max without taking a break. So you then need to put your recovery in there so you can sustain that long term. Now, if you look at the basics of a lot of the studies that are done in the corporate world, and if we look at even in the athletic world, um, except when we're doing real high intensity, it's about a three to one work to rest ratio. So for every 45 minutes of say productive work that you're doing, you need about 15 minutes of stepping out, standing up, moving the body, recovering, and coming back and then you can do another 45 minutes. Otherwise your performance will decline over time. So I like to call that the performance oscillation. So when you are doing physical work, there's a really strong trigger. If you get your, your intensity too wrong, uh, get it too, get it wrong. So if you go too long and you work too hard, you will feel it. You get a real strong trigger. You notice it. When you work in, uh, if you're sitting down at a desk and you're working in a workspace, generally it's a psychological fatigue. Now, psychological fatigue is generally quite gradual, the decline. And you don't notice what's happening until it's too late. The body's very clever at adapting to it. So you don't have any triggers. And that's why we're hearing a lot of people right now who are saying, I'm so productive right now. I'm going, I'm working 12, 14, 16 hour days. Yes, you can sustain that right now because you're a kid in the candy store and you've got um, everything's bells and whistles, but you're gonna come crashing down very soon if you don't take put some recovery in place. So if we look at that three to one work to rest ratio, 
if you're working three days really full on, you need one day really easy. If you're working um, like uh, three weeks really full on, you need one week recovery. And the higher and harder you need to work, the longer the recovery is going to need to be and also the quality of it. And that's where the sleep comes into play. That's where good nutrition comes into play. That's where the exercise is so important. And most importantly, and this is one that people forget right now, is free the mind. And it's so easy when you sit in front of computers, which many of you are doing right now, you sit in front of these screens where you've got blue light, you've got a lot of stimulation going on, your brain is just churning over and churning and churning and churning and you're thinking lots and you're trying to move and what's my next play going to be? How are we going to get through this? You've got to give the, the mind a chance to relax as well. And it's so important. And so Shane's probably sitting there going, this is what we do with our athletes every single day. Well, these concepts are so important for you as a person who is working. It is no different. High performance in sport is no different whether you're a doctor, nurse, parent, um, business owner, musician. It's exactly the same. So it's important you keep though, you look after yourself through those four basic fundamentals of exercise, nutrition, freeing your mind and recovering with purpose. So uh, maybe I'll hand over to Shane who can <laughs> come, coming from how he's adapting that to his world of sitting in front of a computer. Yeah, Craig, that, those, those comments were, um, were quite, um, impressive now I, I i suppose if if i look at you know the situation that um, most of us are in where we're concerned about uh employees and concerned about staff concerned about the future so you're spending a lot of time nervous energy stress stress on on them and, and you certainly tend to forget yourself in that situation so I, i've um, tried tried to list um, period the the, uh, the COVID nineteen uh, the the, the um, my main cooking feat was wheat fix and Vegemite toast but what my way to relax is is actually cooking so I've I've found that a, a certainly a great uh, a great stress release that puts you in a, a world a, a different world for for a period of time. So in terms of my recovery, um, getting into a routine, doing a bit of exercise, obviously spending a lot of time on the computer, a lot of time on the phone, but really looking forward to um, to cooking up a feast in in the evening. So that that's sort of been my way to handle um, the my recovery period. Great stuff, Shelley. Any any comments on that? I mean, you, you know, in terms of that rest, we had, um, and, and, and you and you and, and, and Gaylene both spoke about it this morning, this, this issue of over revving the engine was, I think, the, you know, this, this engine that's constantly, constantly revving. Um, and, and, and before you know it, it's completely run out of gas. And, and, and I, I just thought that that was a great, great analogy. And, and there was some hormonal relevance to that that you might be able to just share with, with people as well, because it's not just a you know, it, it, it's, it's based in chemicals to a degree, isn't it? Yes, well, I think for some of us, there's a couple of different answers, but for, for some of us, the, um, the, the, the wheel of being on is actually quite addictive, okay, which gives rise to dopamine, which is, you know, a feel-good neurochemical. So we feel good, but we actually, and we can feel, be feeling so good that we, we just don't know when we've run out of fuel you know, and then we're causing all sorts of problems with our adrenals. And so <clears throat> I think the important part here is um, <clears throat> when we're off that wheel, because it feels so good and sometimes addictive, winding down, which we need to learn to do, can feel like a downer. You know, it's like you've had the upper and then you just you don't want to have the downer. And I think we've got, um, if, we're, if you're a high-performance athlete, you know how to train. So you've got to train your brain to come down. And I think Gailene was speaking to us beautifully this morning about how to wind your brain down so you can actually be able to sleep and rest and, and be okay. And for me personally, I am a recovering work addict. I tell you, I love it. But being forced to do homeschooling with a seven-year-old 
or I have to be really present for her, you know? And I'm like, my brain's like, I've got so much to do. I just want to keep doing. But it's like, whoa, I've got to learn to be in this moment to be the best mum I want to be. And how lucky am I to spend time with my seven-year-old? Like, what a beautiful luxury I have in life to influence her a little bit more. And, but I really did struggle the first five days. I thought, what is this? I'm so cranky about homeschooling. But I was coming down. <laughs> you know, I just had to learn to wind into it and um, just be okay with being still. And I think that's been a struggle for a lot of us. Is it's, we've been forced to be still. And what do we do with that? You know, so that's yes. I don't know if that helps. At that's all. A, that's a wonderful insight. I, I, I haven't heard it articulated like that before. But winding down can feel like a downer. It's uh, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's. How, how do you go with that, Azran? As a, mm -hmm. as as, as an, an athlete and a busy CEO, and I mean, you know, whenever I, I I remember I very much remember the first time that I met you in KL, and you, like you literally seemed to me like you almost planned your day to the to the, to the second, and you were throwing out these stats of how many days you travel, and it was it was quite phenomenal. I, I'd love to get your insights into that, and maybe some you know some tools as a result. I mean, you you've obviously achieved incredible things both in the boardroom and 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 and, and uh, you know, on, on the, the racetrack. Um, and, and a lot of it comes with planning. And clearly, you wouldn't have got to where you were if you hadn't built in that, uh, that recovery and that wind down. Well, first, I tried what Shane does, which is to, to learn how to cook. I learned two dishes. But very quickly, I've been banned from the kitchen, uh, because I just make too much of a mess. And, and I, I screw up all my different uh, herbs and ingredients. Uh, so the kids have, you know, ban me from the kitchen. So I, I fall back to what I'm familiar with, but I, I redefine it a bit. So, um, you know, for me, the last seven weeks is, you know, my, my big thing was my turbo trainer, my bicycle. However, what I've learned is to disconnect from Zwift, to disconnect from all the numbers, right? Because oftentimes when we're cycling, we're so fascinated by our watts, our cadence, our speed, our heart rate. But actually all I did was just to switch all the numbers off and just use that time to get familiar with my heart, with my breathing, right? And just to... that was for me a way of kind of just letting go and, and feeling very comfortable because that was my one safe space. But I turned off all the, the normal things that, that get me excited when I'm cycling, just switching off all the numbers. Wow, that's a that's a that's a great technique. Thanks for that, folks. We're we're pretty well out of time. There's uh, no more questions. There's just I think I don't think that's particularly a a, a, a question that you've put there, Manfred. But just uh, you know a bit of a technique you use working from home. Rule of thumb: when I feel my concentration slipping for a short time, I take a short break, drastically dropping. I switch to a different task, and if it's falling apart, I call it a day. Um, not, nice, uh, nice strategy. Thanks, thanks for sharing that. Folks, there's been uh, some amazing insights. I've got a couple of pages of, of, of notes here. I, I'm going to just pick out a, about a few of them. Um, you know, um, Shelley made a comment, values anchor me, principles define me, the joyfulness of giving, which we, we came back to the example that Azran shares, um, the importance of people in these time wanting facts and that not being false, false hope, but, but facts and, and Shane sharing the importance of being totally honest when he dealt with people, you know, people asking, you know, is this going to change and, and the realization and, and the importance to communicate that it's, it, there's going to be a new normal. We come out of here. Um, and, and the importance that, you know, how, how Shelley shared that we, we actually need that, um, you know, the, the, that uh, the, the facts is, is kind of anchored in, in, in our chemistry. Um, uh, the couple of others quickly that I wanted to run through. Uh, I thought the great tip of, uh, of Craig's, the three to one work and rest, uh, really useful. Um, and, and the importance of, you know, the, the four principles you shared, exercise, nutrition, rest, and free the mind. And, and I think that's, uh, you know, kind of segues a little bit into what Azran uh, shared there right at the end. You know, tur turn those numbers off. Let the mind listen to your heart. And, and, and you know, how, how many of us are coming from, a place of heart rather than head at the moment. So, so important to anchor ourselves in our, in our heart. Um, so just in the last couple of minutes, I'm going to go, we, we promised you at the, at the beginning that we'd give you seven, seven tips plus one. 
and I might start with Shelley, if you wouldn't mind just sharing us with, and, and the idea is that we give you eight practical tips to go away with here that you might be able to apply tomorrow when, or even tonight that are going to help you um, to, to come from isolation to, to productivity and prosper during this period. Uh, can I start with you, please, Shelley? Sure. Mine's a bit different tonight. I'm going to pick up on what Azrin said about the heart, actually, because we didn't really get to talk a little bit about social connection. So my tip is um, when we bond and socially connect with others, um, we release oxytocin. And oxytocin is a neurochemical that balances out all of the other anxieties or stresses we might be feeling. But it becomes an elixir for us internally uh, like a sense of self and a sense of you know who we are and our strengths but also it becomes a beautiful elixir for us to bond and collaborate with others in fact without it we can't collaborate because we don't care what other people think and but when we care about others we care about what they think we can be open to them and so i think there's a beautiful opportunity to actually reach out to those people you want to um talk with and i think craig was mentioning this earlier about find the people you want to talk to about with your values etc so do this deep connection but i think the piece for you personally is who are you in all of this and what are your strengths and what are your talents but how can you fall in love with this aspect of self and i'm going to use that word love because it is such a joyful rich heartfelt word and i just don't think we use it enough you know, in this crisis, we must love not only others, but ourselves so we can give ourselves the break and, and the heartfeltness and not be so hard on ourselves as we deal with this really difficult time. So mine's a heart one tonight. So I hope that's helpful, Chris. Thank you, Shelley. That's great. Wonderful. Okay. Azran, you're, you're, thank you. Azran? Well, in, in times of crisis, my, my normal intuition is I've got to figure out what my immediate priorities are, right? So... Uh, for me, the Formula One analogy is, you know, just focus on the next corner because if you try to figure out the whole race, it gets overwhelming. However, what I have to do is I set aside at least one hour a week and I put it on my calendar to say, I'm going to stop all my day-to-day -day stuff and think about what will the world look like 12 months from now or 24 months from now. And just giving me dedicated space and time on my calendar to just think on a longer time horizon. Wonderful. Thank you. That's really, that's really great. Craig? I'm going to go with uh, impact versus effort. So when we're talking about, you know, a lot of you would have been really overwhelmed. And as change occurred and crisis hit, you would have ended up with this massive to-do list. And you, it's quite overwhelming to go, what is urgent right now? What is really important? And so it's quite difficult to determine that sometimes. So I find what I do is I create uh, uh, a two by two box. So two, two squares at the top, two at the bottom. And down uh, up at the vertical axis, I go impact and across the horizontal effort. And what you do is you correlate of your priorities or your tasks, which ones are high impact and low effort, which ones are low effort, low impact, etc. So they're in their different boxes. But what you're looking for is what are the three things today that have the greatest impact with the least amount of effort? And you're, it's easy for you to get through three tasks a day. It's very hard to get through a list of 10. So choose the top three based on F, um, impact versus effort, disregard the rest. And if you get through those top three, then you can bring out the list again and decide what's next. But I think with, with that, you just need to be careful that all the impact and effort isn't based around what's happening right now. You need to, need to have some future thought around how that impact's going to be long lasting into the future as well. So impact and effort and combining with Azran's daily one hour to look into the distance. The analogy I often use is, is riding the bicycle. If we, if, we, if we keep riding, looking at the front wheel, we're sooner or later going to run into the back of a truck or in a tree or off the road. Got to lift your head and see where you're going. Yeah. And, and, and with that, let's move to, to the bicycle and, uh, and, and hear what Shane might be able to share for us. Thank you, Chris. Um, you know, as, as we said Sorry, before, Shane, what, what just, is be, the... just before you go, I just want to interrupt you. I've got to say thanks to Shelley. Sure. She's got to run. We've run slightly over. You've got to run for another call. Thanks so much, Shel. <laughs> Lovely to see you. Thank you, thank you so much for your everyone. time. Have a great night. Okay. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thanks, Sorry, thanks, Shane. Yeah, no, no problem. Uh, what we mentioned before about, you know, what, what is the new normal? Well, 
what is the new handshake? What is the, the new hug? Uh, you know, the, the, because it, it is going to be different in, in the normal, in the in the future. So, I, I think in this situation we're in at the moment, I'm, I'm finding visual um, a visual connection is, is really important. So whenever I do, I, I do speak to any member of the organisation and, and beyond. It, it, it's via the, the video as opposed to just a just a telephone call. I, I, I've certainly um, looked and and um, been aware of the people within the organisation and, and their value. So I think valuing people in, in this in this current climate is is important. Yeah, sure. Everybody has their idiosyncrasies, and sometimes sometimes you want to. You want to give them a little kick up the bum every now and then, but certainly valuing people has been a major, a major focus for, for me in this in this period. Um, because it, as uh, we mentioned, I mean, every everybody certainly has um, has their their own unique expertise. So I think it's uh, this period; it's time to recognise that more than ever. Yeah, great, great point. And it's, it's really been interesting. It's been this recurring theme on the aid station interviews I've done is, you know, everyone putting people that's so important. Azran shared it yesterday. You know, Andrew Messick shared it. You've shared it. Craig shared it. It's, it's just been, you know, the, those organizations that put their people first and look after them are going to be the ones that are going to thrive out of this and the ones that communicate well, in my opinion. Yeah. Folks, it's, it's been wonderful. We've got a, a few minutes, five minutes over time, but thank you so much. Craig, um, Shane, wish you all the very best. We, we hope that we'll see the team racing again. Thank you for making the time. I hope you'll be out on the street interacting with real people and, and, and getting some, uh, some, some chance with that very soon. Thank you so much. Great to see you again. Craig, thank thanks for joining us twice today. And Azran, wonderful to see you again. All the people that have tuned in, thank you very much. Uh, have a wonderful evening, night, wherever you might be. Thanks so much.